everybody. Um, welcome to the World Affairs Council. We're doing our one of our three Zoom uh, interviews this week uh, with Dr. Mia Blue, who's Professor of Communications at Georgia State University, the university that I have the honor of being associated with, teaching at, and I'm also a grad. Um, so uh, that's a pleasure to have you. Uh, Dr. Bloom is a native of Montreal, has her PhD from Columbia University, her master's from Georgetown, and her BA from McGill, U McGill University, which is Canada's finest university, if I am not mistaken. That's what the Simpsons says. Well, they invited me to be a guest speaker, a, a guest lecturer this fall, so I decided they, they're the best in Canada. Uh, Dr. Bloom speaks French, English, Arabic, Russian, Hebrew, and says, but is not sure she speaks three others, um, which we won't even get into. Um, taught at Princeton, Cornell, Harvard, McGill, now at Georgia State, and she's a neighbor of mine, which is very important. So, uh, Dr. Boone, let me ask you a question. How, you know, you grew up in Montreal, you go to McGill. How in the world did you decide to get into the study of extremism? I mean, how did you decide that's what you wanted to do with your life? Uh, so actually, before I went to McGill, I was a student at Tel Aviv University. Mm. And so I had started studying extremism before I kind of started college. I had a scholarship to spend a year there and um, again, it was the 1980s, there was no jihadi terrorism yet, but there still was terrorism. And so I was fascinated by all that. And I had some wonderful teachers at Tel Aviv University who then, went, after I got my bachelor's degree, I was able to work with some of them again at Georgetown University. And so I was a research assistant in the uh, Department of Government, even though I was only a master's student there. So it was a wonderful experience but it really did inspire me because seeing how a society handled terrorism on a daily basis and how the return to normal was so quick was really fascinating as well as what motivated people to get involved with terrorist groups in the first place. Okay, and you're gonna screen share some slides with us, right? Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to see, I'm new, relatively new to Zoom, so I'm gonna share the screen. If I can learn it, you can learn it. Oh, you think so? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Let's go to share. You got There you go. Okay. There we go. So, um, basically, I just want to thank everyone for taking time out of their day to join us for this chat. And I usually have to do this disclaimer. The reason I have this slide, because of course you see me, I'm right here, is that um, all of my research uh, while I've been at Georgia State has been funded by the Minerva Research uh, uh, Initiative, the MRI, as part of the Department of Defense. And so I need to let you know right now that anything I say, opinions I have or mistakes that I made are my own. And I don't represent DOD or the Department of the Navy or Minerva although Minerva has been defunded. So that's sort of, I won't have to do that next year, but this research is part and parcel of the research that I'm conducting with my grad students, looking at terrorist um, propaganda and social media. Should I proceed to go to the next one? Well, let me, just, let me ask you this. So first, you know, we're talking about extremism. Can you define extremism for everybody? I mean, and you've got your next slide has got uh, talks about that, right? Right. And so I think that it's very important that when we talk about extremism, we make the distinction between um, actions, behaviors, and thoughts. I, you know, this might be a little unpopular to say, but I've never been of the mind to, in terms of talking about countering violent extremism, trying to look into people's hearts and minds is almost impossible. And so instead of looking at extremism, I look at violent extremism, but that violent extremism, which leads to behaviors. So I, you know, again, if you want to sit at home yelling at your TV, posting on social media that you hate a group, that's kind of your business. But if you're then going to either inspire people or encourage people to take action, or you yourself are taking action, that's where I'm looking at that extremism as violent extremism and ultimately very problematic. Okay, so I can have, 
you know, I can be on the left, I can be on the right, I can belong to this religion or that religion. I can have views that aren't popular, but that does not make me an extremist. Well, you can still be an extremist, but that's not a problematic extremist. You okay. know, we have people who consider themselves extremists if they're on the far left or for animal liberation, and that's fine as long as you're not, you know, blowing up labs or trying to set free all the animals from a fur farm. So in other words, the moment it leads to action, and it's usually about targeting either an ethnic, racial, gender, or whatever group, as soon as you're having this in-group, out-group conversation where you're targeting a group because they're different from you, leading to violent action, that's where I sort of take issue where it, and where I find this to be uh, leading towards terrorism or at least a function of terrorism. Okay, let's go to your next slide. Okay. So, you know, basically we've got about 4 billion people who are currently under a lockdown and not just Department of Homeland Security, but the ADL and the FBI have all warned about the potential surge in hate crimes. And I'm talking okay. everything. Stop, stop here and, and, and tell me why. I mean, what's the connection? Okay, I'm, I'm locked down, you're locked down. You know, my neighbors, my children, everybody I know is locked down. How does, what's the connection between that and violent extremism? Well, so what happens during a lockdown and what actually tends to exacerbate violent extremism are certain things like, for example, the perception of government or, or police overreach or sort of worsening socioeconomic conditions, as well as negative perceptions of maybe legislative action. All of these things were exacerbating right wing extremism before the pandemic. And this is something that FBI Director Ray testified before a congressional committee about. And so now we're seeing all of these things sort of on steroids. Added to that, the lockdown is exacerbating people's feelings of loneliness, of enemy, frustration, anger, juxtaposed with this background of worsening economic conditions and the perception that, you know, you can't trust the government. Hmm. Okay, so you've got these three warnings here put out by DHS. So it wasn't just DHS, but I wanted to give you an example that DHS had generated already three memos from very early on in the crisis. The first one basically saying the terrorists of all kinds might, ex might exploit this pandemic, as we're talking about today, that they discussed on the 30th of March a plot to attack a Missouri medical facility, and then more recently, the 1st of April, how they would weaponize, these groups might weaponize the virus. And they were using social media, in particular Telegram, these encrypted channels, to talk about how to weaponize the virus. What's interesting, again, from the perspective of my research, is that the extreme right wing was doing this, as well as jihadis. And so they were coming out with the exact same messaging. Wow. Wow. Okay. So take us to the next step. What do we, what, you know, what, what's happening? What's going on? So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of one of these bottom line up front people. I want to give you your dessert before dinner. What is the, you know, the end result of this study that I've started over the last few weeks is that the groups are using COVID-19 in three different ways. One is to undermine people's trust in government. And this is a problem because there is a trust deficit against the government in many parts of the world. It's not just 50% of the American population doesn't trust the government or that you have conspiracy theories, but we're seeing this in almost every country. And it's especially the case when the government lacks a certain amount of legitimacy. The other thing that the groups are doing is that they are using the ineptitude of the government in handling the crisis in order to show these are failed or corrupt leaders. And the leaders also are buying into this in some ways by exacerbating the inequalities. So what do I mean by that? In different countries around the world, as the governments are allocating, whether it's PPE or hand sanitizer or other financial benefits, what they've tended to do is that they're giving it as a form of patronage to their most loyal supporters, or they're dividing it along sectarian lines. And in doing that, what they're doing is excluding huge chunks of the population. When that happens in places like Nigeria or Sri Lanka, jihadis come in and say, you see, they hate the Muslims. We are your only solution to survive this pandemic. But they also say, we have been making these apocalyptic prophecies that the end of days is coming. 
And you see, here's an example of the end of days. And they're using that to inspire people to commit some sort of terrorist attack, attack. So they'll say, for example, in places like Somalia or Yemen or Malaysia, well, you know what, it's better to die a martyr than die of COVID-19 at home. And then the wow. third thing that they're doing is that they're using the distraction of the crisis in order to expand their operations. Now, these are operations territorially, but also online. So they're targeting the most at-risk populations, they're targeting prisoners, they're targeting people who are in refugee or IDP camps, and the poor, all of whom they know are probably going to suffer from the virus the most. And how they're doing that is they are presenting themselves as service providers. So from Afghanistan to the slums, the favela slums of Brazil, both terrorists and criminal gang networks are stepping into the void left by the government and reinventing themselves as good guys. Wow. Okay. Let, 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 me, let me take you back a little bit. I mean, you said there's no difference between geographic territory and online territory. Can you talk about that for a second? I mean, the online side of that, because that's, okay, so, I guess I'm of a age where that's not entirely clear to me. Well, what the terrorists are doing is that they are exploiting the fact that lots of people, as, as we are, stuck at home, and there is a lot of time that they're spending on their computers. And so we've seen, for example, a massive uptick in the amount of propaganda that ISIS is generating. And so not only are they back to where they were in 2016, where they were generating tons of propaganda every day. Uh, Michael Cronin talks about the fact that they've created a virtual Netflix for all the propaganda so that like we're streaming all the Netflix movies, they're streaming all their propaganda, but they're also increasing the sophistication and the functionality of their online websites. So that and they where, are- And where are they doing more. this? I mean, I thought they, uh, where are they doing this from? I thought they didn't have, they didn't control their territory anymore. These are guys and, and women in London and Karachi and, and, and Brooklyn doing this? Absolutely. And so people who are in Indonesia and Malaysia and all over the world in Southeast Asia, they are also stuck at home. And so what ISIS and many of these other insurgent and terrorist organizations are doing is they're exploiting the fact that they have all these hours alone at home and that they can now perfect certain things on the internet. So in fact, being control of territory in Syria and Iraq is even less important during this time now. But territorially, they're taking advantage of the fact that even the security forces or US military have to socially distance so that they're trying to liberate their brethren from all the prisons in Syria and Iraq. Wow, okay. I, I apologize for cutting you off. Please uh, continue. Not at all. Okay, so I just what I did was I pulled off of the social media platforms for the different groups um, some samples of what they're talking about when they talk about COVID-19. Now, the groups that I'm looking at are just, just to be um, transparent about this, this wasn't just an opportunistic pivot to look at COVID-19. What happened was we we're, we're got all these different projects where with Shuki Cohen and John Jay, we're examining incels, which are involuntary celibates. These are the guys who are alone, unhappy about how they're treated by women, and very often will express that unhappiness through uh, violent acts. So for example, Alex Manassian in 2018, or Elliot Roger in California in 2014, or even um, Valerie Fabricant in 1992, but I'll get there in a second. So we saw that the incels were talking about COVID-19, and the jihadis were talking about COVID-19, and the right-wing extremists were also. So I've got a few examples here just to show you. For the incels, they are expressing this sort of both suicidal and empathetic schadenfreude about the COVID-19. That COVID-19 is actually normalizing their way of life, of being isolated, not dating, not having sex. And in fact, you see some of the comments that they're making is that they're very happy now that the rest of the world has to deal with what they deal with on a daily basis. And you see that, you know, for them, they're saying, oh, we're sorry for the American incels, the American cells who are in, you know, having to deal with this, but they want to see the world burn. The other, the other group that we're examining also looks at the right wing media that is blaming the foreigners. And so for them, it's the extreme far right 
um, they call them now white racially motivated groups that view the pandemic as an opportunity to advance views and beliefs that they previously already held. So for example, they're blaming Bill Gates and George Soros and the Jews, it's always the Jews. And so this is a way in which they're taking the current pandemic and, and translating it to things that they already believed in. And just realized I was on the wrong screen to show you the big picture. Yeah, so you that's, see, oh, that's better, yeah. I apologize. Uh, you, this is new to Zoom. Uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, the, it has been a topic, a main topic, and they're blaming Soros. And in fact, even someone like David Duke is, again, quoting Bibi Netanyahu's son, that George Soros is ultimately to blame. You know, these memes about Gates or Jews or Soros, and you see it not just in the United States, but all over the world. So we're seeing this, for example, in Europe, where the same against Jews controlling the world or secretly trying to bring the virus. I mean, again, this is exactly what happened with the Black Plague. The Jews were blamed for the Black Plague in the uh, 13th and 14th century. So here you have another example where you have a Trojan horse, which is the virus, and then you have the globalist Jew inside trying to infiltrate. So these are things that are happening over and over again. The tropes have existed for hundreds of years, and it's always the same groups who are blamed. And I'm just gonna go one more, but here's where it's a little bit different. The virus has gaslit a lot of people who are xenophobic. On the far right, you know what they call them, white racially motivated attacks, that they want to shut down immigration. And they're blaming the coronavirus on immigrants, and we see it accentuate, they won't call it COVID-19, it's gotta be called the Wuhan flu or the Wuhan virus. And these are things that they already believed in. So basically, they previously wanted to shut down immigration, but in fact, now they have a justification for it. Wow. This is super disturbing. I have to tell you, I've never, I've never said the word incel before. I mean, that sound is like going right past me. So well, so the, the incel, it's, a, it's relatively new. We started talking about it in 2018 after the attack in Toronto. You know, Al, uh, Alex Manassian took his car and he rammed it into the sidewalk to kill all these pedestrians. He was trying to kill women. But if you actually look at what the ideology says, you can trace the incels all the way back, and we go as far back as like Ted Kaczynski, and mm -hmm. Shuki is able to show that it goes back even further. Believe it or not, Goebbels was an incel. So in fact, we can trace this ideology of hatred towards globalism, women, minorities, all wrapped up into one. And it's something that I've been doing work for the Anti-Defamation League to try to understand how these groups tend to cluster together. Because for me, what's so interesting and amazing is that you've got the jihadis and the extreme right wing all saying the same thing. And the incels, they're all blaming their cities. They're all blaming the cosmopolitan nature of cities. They blame women and that we are the sources of virus. And so it is very interesting to see how all these groups that are so different can agree on that one thing. The thing I'm, I'm wrestling with, I mean, there's obviously people who think, you know, France or the United States should have less immigration, but aren't terrorists, right? Um, there are people who think, gosh, we've over-globalized, you know, we can't get the face mask because too much of the production has moved to China. But that doesn't make you an extremist well, or, or a jihadi or an incel, right? I differentiated between extreme thought and extreme action. Okay. It's certainly, you know, just because someone doesn't like immigrants doesn't make them, doesn't make them a terrorist. But if they're going to, for example, we saw uh, attacks against Asian Americans, including an acid attack in Brooklyn against a right. woman who was just taking out her trash, that, that is an act of violence. And when it's being coordinated online, and again, one of the other things we see is the role always, it's always about Russia, the role that Russia is playing in propagating disinformation about the coronavirus and also trying to exacerbate these cleavages in our society against immigrants, 
against, you know, different political parties, then it all starts to look very coordinated. So, you know, the problem is the virus is COVID-19. Someone who is insisting on calling it the Wuhan virus or the Wuhan flu, at this point, it's kind of irrelevant what you call it, it's COVID-19. And in fact, what scientists have done is shown that uh, at least 50% of the virus that's in the United States came via Italy and right. not China. So again, it's one of these things where it's a distraction to be arguing what to call it because we really do have to all come together and fight the virus as a cohesive country as a whole. So let me ask some, a, a question. Where, where are you most concerned about? I mean, there's countries around the world that don't have the health infrastructure where the government lacks in legitimacy to begin with, with a large percentage of the population. You know, whether you're talking Iraq or Egypt or Ecuador, um, Bolivia, I mean, you name the country and when they're faced with this pandemic and this huge pressure on institutions that were weak to begin with, right? I mean, wh where are you most concerned? Wh where do you think this is going to have the biggest impact? Well, my concern is that in places that are already suffering from a lack of infrastructure. So for example, in Syria, currently Syria is only at 50% of its hospital capacity, not because of COVID-19, but because of Russian and, and government aerial bombardments of their hospitals and of their medical facilities. And so once this starts to hit really poor areas, you know, areas where you cannot socially distance, areas, for example, in a refugee camp, it is going to cut a swath through the refugee camps in ways that are problematic because, as I said, the terrorists are trying to offer themselves as service providers. They're reinventing themselves as good guys, whether it's um, trying to provide, like stepping in where the government is absent and they are offering PPE, they're offering funds, they're even distributing hand sanitizer in a way to try to curry favor and add more recruits. But the thing that's really problematic is that many of these governments that are corrupt or sort of lean towards authoritarian are also manipulating the virus. And so we're just gonna see the chasm between the haves and the have nots just widen further, and the people who are the poorest in society will suffer the worst from the virus. And that's the concern I have, as well as the fact that we're seeing sectarian divisions also widening because the go governments are allocating these benefits based on patronage. And so in places like Nigeria or in Sri Lanka, they connect giving out PPE or giving out financial assistance to only people loyal to them, which right. means not the Muslims. So what do the jihadis do? They come in and they say, well, we'll help you. And then they, they're basically getting almost like a renewal of popularity because people see them in a positive light, whether it's Taliban or Hezbollah or even the mafia who's doing that in places like Calabria and Bologna. My word. Okay, we've, we asked, and I'm gonna to apologize to the people on the line. We've asked people uh, to email questions in advance. So we've got so many people we're concerned about we're trying to manage it all. No problem. So, I'll me... stop here with this. I'll leave this up here because, again, the uh, some of the evangelicals on the extreme far right and the jihadis are all calling it a punishment from God. So they also have that in common. Which is amazing uh, to, to think of, isn't it? I mean, just it, extraordinary. It, it, it's disheartening. But, you know, one of the things, one of my other projects, the reason I got interested in the incels is that all these groups that are so diverse, they, they all hate women. They all hate gay people. They all hate Jewish people. And I'm like, wow, you guys have so much in common. You really should be good friends. <laughs> okay. Here's, here's a question from Victoria Lee. How do we address, how do we confront the average extremists on the streets? Because they obviously don't come to forums like this, right? Uh, should the local authorities have done more months ago using public service announcements or TV ads? Um, you know, what, what, what should we have done? How do, how do we, how do city governments and provincial or state governments, central governments, how do we deal with this? Well, I mean, the biggest problem is the lack of legitimacy and the trust deficit that I mentioned at the beginning. 
what we have found in different countries and sort of outside the United States is that local governments tend to have a lot more legitimacy uh, than the central government. The central government is very often perceived mm. as corrupt and authoritarian. And so it's really important that we get the, sort of the smaller local governments and also community leaders involved. So it's very, it's, it's very different that if you're talking to an extremist, they're not going to listen to you if you hit them over the head with a PSA message. But if they're hearing it from the leaders of their own community, so for example, the role of religious authorities is really important. And being able to say to your flock, listen, we miss you in our house of worship, but stay home and stream us in real time is, is far more powerful than having the governor of New York or the governor of Washington State or California tell people you can't go to church. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question from Alexandra Stein. What, if, what do you think, what's your reaction to the possibility that there may be an exit path for some of the extremists, that it might open up as a result of the pandemic, given that group mandated activity might slow down during pandemic and therefore arousal of attachment feelings for and possible reconnection with family and friends that extremists have isolated themselves from as a result of belonging to their group? I mean, is there a possibility? I mean, could you use this? If governments were clever, could they use this time to, I don't know, what's the right word, reintegrate uh, extremists? Well, I think the anomie and the isolation tends to exacerbate the very same conditions that um, led people down the extreme pathway to begin with. So I don't know if that's necessarily that the fact that they can't meet in person, we've had online recruitment and radicalization for as long as we've had the chat rooms and the web forums. So I don't know if that necessarily mitigates the problem, but we, we can have opportunities for people to have um, exit ramps off so that if we do a good job in terms of, uh, I know that there are a number like Moonshot CVE is working very closely with Google to try to offer people, if they go searching on the internet for radical content, they're gonna be offered a different kind of video that may de-radicalize them. So I think that there's opportunities that can go in either direction. Uh, but it's important that we also remember that the mental health uh, impact of this isolation and social distancing might also exacerbate individual feelings for self-harm. And that's one of the other things that we need to be careful of. So it's not just about radicalization, it's about whether or not people might end up being very depressed and suicidal. So this is where there needs to be different kinds of interventions, mental health interventions, and um, opportunities for people to get help in ways that are acceptable to them. So in ways that aren't shaming. So there is a possibility that not meeting in groups, but mm -hmm. people can still Zoom online. We've had a lot of Zoom bombing on the far right, the ADL, and have recently done a report on this. So this is where I would love to think that the lockdown or the social distancing will make things better, but I kind of see it as making things worse and uh, accentuating some of these pre-existing problems. Um. That's encouraging. Uh, do you have it? Where's Where's the good news in this? That's me. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, where's the? I mean, I I'm gonna be honest. I don't know. I mean, the good news is that the environment is healing. The good news is that there's far less. I like, think there's something like 40, 50 percent less smog in many parts of the globe that you could never even see the sky. So, you know, if you want to put a silver lining, I don't think the silver lining is this. And although you know there was an argument. Barry Posen made on foreign affairs, arguing that the pandemic might actually create incentives for countries that are in conflict to um, end the conflict or at least get involved in ceasefires. So we saw that, for example, in Yemen. There is an argument that there mm -hmm. could be possible unintended positive consequences of this coronavirus. Okay, here's a question from Burster Iron. I think I may be mispronouncing the name. Uh, will extremists consider this a propitious time to carry out attacks on vulnerable soft targets, uh, given the massive shift of resources and attention by governments towards fighting the pandemic itself? So is this- Absolutely. This Absolutely. I mean, the, all of the extremists are looking at this as 
a possible opportunity. So for ISIS, this is validating their apocalyptical end of days premonition. Or, you know, what they're saying is, well, if you're going to be dying anyways of COVID-19, why don't you perpetrate an attack as a martyr? Because it's better to be a martyr than to die alone at home. And you're seeing that message over and over again. Or they're saying, well, the end is near. Now is your last chance to join us and be a martyr. So it's almost like, you know, um, creating that FOMO where you have a limited time to react. They are exploiting it that way. And the other groups are exploiting it because they're pushing an agenda that they previously already believed and using the virus to move that forward. For example, groups that are extreme right wing that don't like foreigners are using this to add you know, fuel to the fire. And in fact, it's worked because the president has shut down immigration, shut down green cards for 60 days at least. So we are seeing that people who wanted this to happen before the virus are using the virus to validate their worldviews. Are, are there examples of attacks that have been carried out by violent extremists during this period of uh, COVID? So there was the attack that DHS mentioned about the Missouri medical facility. Right. And then they've been monitoring since April 1st how people are saying from the jihadis to the right wing that you should go uh, to, let's say, Jewish community centers and cough on door handles or, you know, anyone who has the infection, ISIS has said, where you should go to the enemy and get them sick. In other words, using people like a, a real world WMD. Here's a question from your colleague, Dr. Karen Locke from Georgia State University. What are the mechanisms and channels on how the violent extremists use to accomplish their disruptive actions? What do governments or businesses or individuals need to know? And what can we, you know, whether it's at the government level or at the, the corporate level or at community level, what is it that we can do to, to mitigate these risks? Well, a lot of what um, has been happening, you know, since uh, President Obama initiated the campaign at the White House for countering violent extremism, it was about community level organization and getting communities involved to in many ways self-police and get them involved in making sure that their communities were safe, as well as creating opportunities to leave one of the things that comes out from, if you guys have a chance to read Christian Picciolini's um, autobiography, he has actually two books, definitely worth reading. He also has an MSNBC series. When he was starting to have doubts, instead of, um, he was very worried people would find out that he was having doubts about being in the neo-Nazis, he actually got more tattoos and he beat up more people of color. And in fact, he said more hateful things. And so part of the problem was, people start to have doubts about being part of these extremist groups and don't know how to follow through. They don't know where they can leave, how they can leave and do it so safely. So having those opportunities is where either government or industry can play a role. So for example, Google has worked very closely with organizations like Moonshot CVE to help. There's um, a UN initiative for countering extremism, UNCTED. So we're seeing a multi-pronged approach to try to offer people a way out, but a way out safely. Because what happens is people may even act out as they're having doubts in ways that make them look more extreme, sure. when in fact they're doing it because they really want to leave. Well, how do you, how do, you do research from your apartment? Um, I mean, how do you keep up? How do you know what's going on? How are you, you know, you don't, you're not there with your, your graduate students. Um, you said you, you, that you, that you wrote an article and then that article has grown into something that's closer to a academic paper. I mean, how do you, how do you do that? Um, stuck in your, stuck, I don't say stuck, that doesn't sound right, but, but um, restricted to your, the, your, your own residence? Well, so the, the work that we do on social media, we can do that anywhere. Uh, for the last uh, four and a half years, 
uh, thanks to the Minerva Research Initiative that funded the, pro the research project that I'm doing, we've been inside the encrypted apps for uh, ISIS, and we've been able to monitor on a daily basis what they've been doing and saying for almost five years. Um, so this has been, this can be done anywhere. And I've got very dedicated grad students who collect every single day. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary project that I'm working not just with students from communication, political science, but also computer science in order to create a platform that anyone can search if they're looking for a particular area or issue. So for example, UNITAD, the UN uh, legal arm, has asked us to work with them to help build a case, um, a war crimes case against ISIS because we have everything that ISIS bragged about. So we can now go through all the images and code things like an execution or you know acts of genocide or a massacre. And that's one of the projects we're doing for the UN. Um, but the other thing that I've been very fortunate is I'm part of a, a women's action network, ICANN and Wassel. And so every Thursday, it's me and uh, women peace builders from around the world. And I get all the information about what's going on with COVID-19 in real time. And so I find out what's going on in Algeria and Yemen and Jordan and Syria and Colombia and all over the world every Thursday. And so, you know, I take notes, I sit there. And so I'm getting this information well before the media is getting it and being able to build these trends as I, as I talk about these big pictures to show how the responses are clustering in the ways that they are. Okay, so when, when you say ISIS media or incel media or uh, right-wing extremist media, how, how do you, first of all, has the volume, the, just the, the quantity increased? And secondly, is that, how do you know it's not, you know, one person doing a whole bunch of stuff as opposed to, you know, an organized group of people producing this? I mean, I, I would think that, uh, you know, one really unhappy person working on this full time, isolated in his or her apartment could turn churn out a ton of stuff. So uh, with the incel data, we have, um, I'm working with Shuki Cohen. And he is, I'm sorry, who is Shuki Cohen? Shuki Cohen is a um, psychologist and criminologist at John Jay College. He runs the terrorism center at John Jay. Okay. And so he's the leading psychologist working on incels right now. And so he's collected millions of these incel posts. And of course, there's micro data on all the postings so that you can see that it's not the same person. What we were able to do with the ISIS data a lot of it was geotagged originally. They forgot to turn off their location services so we could see who was doing it and how often. But we knew with ISIS that sometimes they were using bots in order to generate the exact same message across multiple platforms. So because we work with computer scientists and you know, there's fantastic colleagues at Georgia State that are uh, at the top of their game looking at AI, we can use their tools to examine the data and the micro level data to make sure that it's not just, what did, what did Trump once say? Some guy, some fat guy in his- Some fat guy in his bedroom, his right? Parents basement in his bed. Yeah. So it's yeah. not just the one. Plus the volume is so high that it would be impossible without these bots, let's say for ISIS, it would be impossible to generate 300 messages in a fraction of a second. So this is where you could see all of this. Again, if you know what you're looking for. And then uh, finally, uh, part of this is with experience. You know, We've been doing this for so many years as part of the Minerva research that you know, we have a certain amount of expertise now in this space. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch just a little bit. Um, I, your Twitter followers know, and your 13,000 Twitter followers, he said enviously. Um, <laughs> your Twitter followers know that you've been spending a lot of your time while you're isolated cooking. Jay, can you talk, I mean, why in the world? Are you, I mean, you're, you're doing a, a recipe a day, I think, and uh, with video showing people how to, how do you do, how are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Or it, you, it, it, what, what's the method behind this? So what happened was before the pandemic, I would occasionally post images of, of 
you know, food that I had made. Um, it was part and parcel of a desire eventually to write this cookbook from garbage to gourmet. The idea was instead of throwing things out, you found a way to repurpose them. And so I was trying to develop, you know, my skills in the kitchen for the next, book, the next book after the one that's coming out in 2020, a book on women and terrorism, another sort of an update. I've got, I want to do a cookbook. And RV Gundar, who I've never met, but knows me from Twitter, said, why don't you during the quarantine help people cook? And so the idea that I got was a lot of people are facing financially a crunch. And so maybe I could show people recipes that were really delicious, but very cheap. And so I show people how to take for, let's say, $5 and make an entire meal or make a meal for four people for seven or eight dollars. And I do the step by steps in order to demystify it and show that it's really easy to do. So then I started taking requests where people were like, well, I had this dish in a restaurant. And so I would break down the dish and also show substitutions because the purpose was to stay at home. So that if you didn't have a particular ingredient, I was gonna show you how to make that ingredient. So for example, I use hoisin sauce a lot. And so I showed people how to make hoisin sauce from soy sauce, garlic, and peanut butter. So in other words, things that you do have, I can help you turn that into a gourmet meal. You don't feel like you're missing the restaurants and you know, you're making your money stretch because a lot of people are having a really tough time. So is this, is this all gringo food or what, what are you doing? Oh, I do, I do everything. So I basically, um, I took a can of corn and I made elotes and mm. I took sort of, I did a poor man's Peking duck with chicken and I showed people how to use a soft tortilla and turn that into an amazing wrap. Uh, I showed people how to make beer can chicken with just you know a can of beer, a chicken and some spices, but cooking it in a bunt pan. So these are a lot of these are about technique. I think the one that was most popular was I took a can of chickpeas and just by different kinds of cooking techniques and applications, turned it into a crunchy snack that even my friends who do not cook were like, I can do that. That's only two ingredients. So what's your, what's your Twitter handle? Where can we find this? Uh, so it's uh, Mia M. Bloom, all M's. And I post almost every day. I, I skipped a few days this week as uh, a friend of mine passed away and I just didn't feel like cooking for Twitter. But it's called Quarantine Cuisine. And if there's a recipe or if you have things in your kitchen and you need to figure out how to get rid of them, you want to maximize because you don't want to go to the grocery store email me or post to me and I'll give you a good recipe how to make it. And if it's, uh, if it's something that I have, I can demo it and show you in real time each little step. That's so cool. Well, I'm, I was going to say thank you, Dr. Mia Bloom, and I'm going to say uh, thank you, Chef Mia. This, <laughs> <laughs> this has been a great 45 minutes. I want to thank you for giving us so much of your time. I can see your kitchen in the background and uh, it looks like you're, you're ready to go this evening. So. <laughs> Yeah, there it I'm, ready is. To, I'm ready to make cocktails, clearly. <laughs> yeah. Well, that too. In my lecture in Zoom, we're like, Professor, are you Zooming from a bar? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just drink a lot at home. Anyhow, let's, let me tell you what we've got coming up. Uh, and I realized at the very beginning, I didn't tell people who I was. I'm Charles Shapiro. I'm the president of World Affairs Council of Atlanta. I apologize for not introducing myself when I introduced Dr. Bloom. Um, Tomorrow, we've got a program with Ambassador Thomas Pickering, who's a former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, to Russia, to India, to Israel, to Jordan, Nigeria, and El Salvador. I may be forgetting one. Um, but he, what he wants to talk about is Iran, Iran during COVID-19, and how, um, from his perspective, this presents an opportunity for the United States to reach an understanding with, with Iran. So if you've not registered already, please go to our website, wacatlanta.org, wacatlanta.org, and um, uh, uh, register. On Thursday, we've got Eduardo Martinez. Ed Martinez is the president of the UPS Foundation. Uh, and we're going to talk about both what's happening to UPS as a, as a corporation, as a business, and its response to COVID, but also what the UPS Foundation is doing to help people around the world. Um, next week on May 6th, we've got the European Union Ambassador to the United States, Stavros Lambrinidis, uh, talking about it's Europe Day is the 9th of May. 
which is a weekend. So we're going to do Europe Day with Ambassador Lambrinidis and talk about the European Union and how it's dealing with all of these stresses uh, caused by uh, COVID and how different countries are responding. And of course, there's a lot of tension on how do the poor countries get the money they need to deal with this. And then on May 8th, we've got Dennis Lockhart, who's the former CEO of the Atlanta Fed, now a adjunct professor at uh, Georgia Tech. And he's going to, he's talking about that what we can expect, what we should look for in the economy post COVID. So it's going to be fabulous. I want to thank the UPS Foundation, who in part has made this 45 minutes possible. I want to thank all of you who joined us today. This has just been a great conversation. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. If you're already a member of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta, please renew now, even if your membership isn't due. Uh, like everybody else, we need the money. We're not doing in-person programs where these are free. So please renew uh, if you if now uh, upgrade your membership to the next highest level. If you're not a member, now's the time to join the World Affairs Council. And whether you're a member or not, please go to our website, make a donation because we need it to make ends meet. So thank you all very much, Dr. Mia Bloom. This has been great. This has been great fun. I appreciate it. And I I'm, Thank I'm you, gonna... everyone, for coming. Also, if you had a question and Ambassador Shapiro wasn't able to read your question, I will happily answer your questions either on Twitter at Mia M. Bloom or you can email me to Georgia State. It's mbloom3 at gsu.edu. If, let's say, for instance, I see Joshua Yang raise his hand, email me. I promise I'll give you an answer right away. That's so cool. Thank you so much. You've been really generous with your time, generous with your kitchen, generous with your recipes, and generous with uh, offering to answer questions. Not now, but whenever people have. Thank you very much. This, this has been terrific. Thank you. And listen, you guys stay home and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.